Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Transfigured. I'm here with my friend Luke. Luke has been on the channel multiple times. Uh, I think you were maybe even like my second or third guest. And I think that you might be retaking your crown of most frequent guest. Uh, Take well, that, Bo Branson. I, yeah, Bo Branson or Trip are competing with you. Hank's in oh. his own special category because he's mm -hmm. like a co-host. So that in many that ways. Count. Yeah. yeah. Um, but Luke and I want to talk about confessionalism, propositions, creeds, group belonging, in and out of church. And this is, of course, uh, triggered or um, made relevant by my recent story that I shared on my channel. Although one thing I should say, a lot of people are reaching out to me, asking me if I'm okay and stuff, which is fine and really nice. And I appreciated it. And in fact, actually, I was extremely overwhelmed by the mm. response to that video. I thought it would be like low hundred views because it would be less exciting than even like my average church father video with Hank, but it like hopped out of the gun faster than almost any video um, that I've put up on YouTube. And a lot of the com, oh, like all the comments were basically extremely kind. And it's like so the I personal stuff is the most relevant and beautiful and true and compelling. Yeah, well, the, the problem is, is I can't be like gamed into just like coming up with increasingly more emotional and personal <laughs> uh, audience capture videos where uh, I'm constantly digging uh, deeper to try and get that uh, uh, that magical juice again. Um, yeah. it, it can be a little dangerous to be too influenced by which of your videos do well and don't do well. For but sure. it's also good to pay attention. Um, but no, I, I was extremely overwhelmed, but I think what most people maybe didn't quite realize is most of the action of that story that I shared is like four or five months old. And yeah. so that I'm kind of have gotten somewhat well past it and moved on in a lot of respects. Um, uh, and it wasn't quite as fresh as it maybe seemed in the video. Maybe I should have done a better job communicating that. But that was part of it, too. Because yeah. I had really waited to release that video until sort of the dust settled. Because um, I didn't want to be... I didn't want to be trying to seem like I was using my YouTube channel and audience to leverage the outcome of that event or to... Um, make my church look bad or to air dirty laundry or anything like that yes which which i'm which not that i want to go down this path i would love to we could just have a conversation on that very thing that you just spoke to which is the i don't know what you'd want to call it i mean this is where i think aspects of postmodernism are right but like the systemic the system of not gossiping respecting your elders, being a good person, all of which you modeled very well, work very much to reinforce the status quo in certain power dynamics, even if they're potentially wrong. And uh, whatever, we could talk about that, which is a legitimate thing, but we don't have to. A, 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 lot of the, a lot of the badness in the system depends on its perpetuation by the sure. good behavior of the members. Absolutely. Yeah. And, yeah. the, and I think unconsciously very often leaders uh, abuse that and don't, because I mean, that's the thing, like this, we, we talked about a little bit before we started with me going back into my story, and I have seen this pattern <clears throat> happen over and over and over. People very often are unwilling and, um, I mean, you could say like suppressed systemically suppress but i but i don't think it's intentional again this is where the the system the principality this is where my tillich all institutions are inherently demonic stuff would come in does the dirty work for you so that people very often i mean i could list off tons of times when some uh church or religious um moral issue or or moral outfalling happened and there there were there were things that were leading up to that where people didn't say something that they thought they saw because they were trying to do the right thing mm -hmm. and be a good person you know we don't want to gossip and we don't want to and leaders i don't know leaders you know there have definitely been times when i've thought leaders are 
well, this happened to me, and this happened to you too. So, like, whatever. I'll just dive into it because we talked about me sharing my my yeah, experience. Please, please um, do. So, uh, probably my worst church experience, uh, and I—I I mean, I think I can talk. I won't go into the specifics, but I think I can talk about it because I don't think anybody from that time of my life follows anything that I do now because we spoke about this offline too. Somewhat when you leave a Protestant, non-denominationally kind of non-mainline church. For the most part, unless you're really intentional, or apart from maybe a few individual relationships maintaining, you're just you're just gone, right? You know, or sometimes it can be even worse than that. That you, there's a stigma uh, attached sure. to you, and like almost like a shunning effect. Where yeah. this this was less true at my most recent church, but it was pretty true two churches ago that yeah. the leadership was actively communicating that I and my family were not to be associated with and that they're uh that people should avoid us and that sort of thing and and so we had almost everyone except for one family really break off communication with us immediately and like i remember even one time running into someone from that church on running into them on the street and mm. them being feeling caught and confused on how to interact with me um, yeah but but that, that that was way less true this most recent time around because it was a much more gentle, soft kind of breakup. You um, weren't like officially excommunicated. Were you the previous time? Yes, yes, like officially, officially, yeah. Well, that kind of, I mean, that and, makes sense. And then that's like what they're told to do, right? right? And then the pastor communicates it down to my Bible study, and you know all those sorts <clears> of <throat> all those sorts of icky things. Um, right. But although this most recent time, I think that some members of the church found out that I had a podcast and some of them have started to listen to it. So be careful, <laughs> you know, uh, the law of unintended consequences. If uh, you're worried about a podcast that someone in your church has and no one listens to it, one of the right. worst things that you could do is make that known and then people get curious. So, uh, right. That, Cause it, it is, it's just a, it's just a dangerous, uh, I don't know. So yeah. So back to my story. So you had mentioned, and this reminded me of my story recently that you, I, and I don't know, forgive me if I share something I shouldn't have shared, but you, when you, my approach to this is always very much like yours because I'm kind of a true believer in this. So like I had a conflict, not really a conflict, but me and this other guy, this young man, uh, would meet together for morning coffees and we would just talk about theology, books we were reading, whatever kinds of different things. And was very he often, clergy or did he have an official no. position? No, just a guy. No, he was just just a guy in the church, and we would do that. I mean, it was kind of apart from small groups because that was an official, kind of sanctioned part of the church. But um, it was just meeting together with him, and uh, and we'd talk about various things. And the day when I was reading, like George McDonald, it's when I was reading Lilith actually. Uh, first, get really getting into George McDonald, um, and I don't know. I've I've just always read. I've always read and listened to the approved list of things from the church, you know, so I'm always, re I, in my ba Baptist Calvinist days, I was always reading John Piper books and Jerry Bridges books and Gospel Coalition books and Tim Keller books, like all the good books. But Jerry Bridges also... is pretty good. I actually quite like Jerry Bridges. <laughs> I think that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he, he's he's fine. I don't, there's aspects of this. Theology. The only book I can remember of his right now, I'm trying to remember the title, is... Um, it's it's some play on it's double imputation so it's like imputed righteousness you know uh the whole idea jesus takes all of all of his good works are credited to you all your bad work are credited to him that whole thing it's a book on that but um which whatever i would not really endorse or i'd talk about it differently but uh so i would read those books but then i would always read i'd also read like you know, I read a long time ago, Blue Like Jazz, or I'd read Rob Bell books, or I'd like Rob Bell, or I'd read, you know, I, I don't, and there was probably even stuff that in Rob, that Rob Bell would say that I wouldn't fully endorse, you know, it's that whole thing, it's just like, you can like somebody without endorsing everything about them, and uh, the same with Piper, but, the, but then other people would never, other people weren't really reading these books, you know, their only exposure to these books and ideas is through me. And so I'm the weird outsider. I mean, I'm believe it or not, I'm kind of the weird outsider in every group I'm in. <laughs> so, uh, so I'd get together with this kid. He was younger than me, and I would talk to him about this stuff. But we would, 
I, so I'm more temperamentally liberal, right? I'm much more open to ideas probably than he is. He's much more temperamentally conservative. And so I would be more or less uh, unsettling and troubling to him a little bit, pushing him a little bit. But I always thought it was okay. You know, I always thought we were friends, but we were having some <clears throat> struggles and disagreements. And, and that and can so be I a thought, healthy dynamic if two friends, one of them is more, hey, what about this? Did Have you considered this? And the other one's like, I'm not so sure about that. Like a good friendship built on that across that dynamic can be a good thing. And you can both yeah. help each other. Yeah, totally. Because there's wisdom um, in both perspectives and they need to be integrated. Yeah, iron sharpening iron type thing. Um, but when, uh, so then we were having a little trouble. So then I was like, well, you know, very much Matthew 18. I was like, well, let's just bring in a third party. I mean, that's generally my my mode of operation is I'm always like, let's just bring in more more perspectives, more people. Let's get more insight. Let's get more accountability. Let's increase transparency, you know. Um, and so I invited uh, the associate pastor of this church, somebody that we both knew and were friends with. He's, you know, a little a little bit of an older guy. He's probably my age-ish. I don't know, something like that. And uh, and so I invited him over to my house one night, both these guys. And so then the night came, and I went and opened the door of my house. Uh, and uh, and all of a sudden, it was it wasn't just the associate pastor; it was also the head pastor. So I without warning. Yeah, without warning. And so like, and this is the kind of thing that I'm talking about, like that, if it, it, it immediately felt wrong, if I'm just going to be frank, uh, because, and this is what I mean about the subtle controlling systemic problems is they feel justified as the leaders to kind of do whatever they want because they are the authority and the power and the leaders of the church. So like all of a sudden behind my back, they're having conversation going on. And then the head pastor discerns and decides that he's going to come here. But like, I don't feel loved and cared for and respected in that situation at all. I feel uh, like it's an intervention, you yeah. know, or like it's uh whatever. They're bringing something in like the that. big guns. Yeah. Right. But, but the whole time I'm trying to be, or like the mafia uh, bringing in the the big guy to because there's some subordinate that's out of line and a message needs to be sent or something like that. Yeah, and so the and so you know, but the whole time I'm trying to be respectful. You know, there's there's all these very deep seated, uh, trained things deeply into me. Like respect your elders, respect your pastors, let them not be. You know what what's that passage of like let it not be burdensome to them. You know the same as like your parents. And so I, and so I just roll with it and like, I don't immediately call it out. Um, and, uh, so anyhow, we, we get into this meeting, this intervention, we're all sitting together in this room. The, the young man's there too. Cause like, I think, I can't remember. I think he was maybe there first, whatever. It doesn't matter. And <clears throat> we're all sitting there. And basically what comes out of this meeting, the short version is the young man says to me, and I truly don't think I'm mischaracterizing all this. He says basically that he, the only reason that he had been getting together with me and meeting with me isn't because he enjoyed it and, and we were friends and we were just having theological conversations. Um, basically, he thinks that I'm uh, heterodox or heretic or dangerous. And so he's trying to take up my bandwidth essentially so that I just don't talk to other people about my ideas. He's like a fall um, guy. Yeah. yeah. And that's so, um, that's so deeply icky. Yeah. And um, I mean, he, you know, he said it in a he wasn't trying to be mean, but more or less that's what was said. And um, and I guess a preface to all this is like when I came to this church, which you will relate to this, um, I had moved there. And, and this is a church within a denomination that I previously attended and knew and was related to a church plant of a longstanding church that I'd gone to and knew a lot of people in, uh, gone to national conferences, knew a lot of people all the way up the hierarchy of this, this denomination. And, uh, you know, uh, and within the Christian reform Calvinist John Piper world, like I know have known and still know a lot of people within that world. Um, and 
so I had been thinking about the doctrine of hell because I had been exposed to this Chris Date debate a long time ago or whatever. But by that time, I was a full-fledged annihilationist. I self-identified as being an annihilationist, and I had thought a lot about all of the biblical arguments for hell. I was very familiar with rethinking hell, which is something we've talked about because you're an annihilationist, correct? Yeah, and, although I grew I grew up an annihilationist, uh, which right. is perhaps I don't know, there there is a difference between this is what I was taught. I don't feel like I'm verging off into weird foreign territory to think that it just feels right. native versus right. after thoughtful consideration. I've changed my mind on this. That Those two things can feel a little different from each other. No, totally. So like for me, what it felt like for me was, OK, I'm told to be that the Bibles are absolute authority, sola scriptura. You know, this is what we are meant to believe. It's very, it's whatever. This is, and that's all stuff that I would have issues with now. But like, so I was like, so I'm trying to really believe this. And then when you get exposed to someone like Chris Day, who's very Protestant, very exegetical, very like believe what the text teaches. Like, I, I think if that's your paradigm, if that's your frame, you should be an annihilationist. Like, the, I would still say that probably to this day. Like, I think if you are, if you are coming from it, from that worldview, uh, follow the text where it leads, which, like, I'm, now I'm orthodox. I mean, I wouldn't, I, I think there's a lot of philosophical problems with that. Like, I've changed again. But if that's your frame, you should be an annihilationist. And so when I went to this church, that's where I was. And so I had meetings before I ever moved with the pastor. I told him all this. I said, this is the position where I'm coming from. I want you to know. I want to be upfront about all this. And, and to whatever degree I can without unsettling people who shouldn't be unsettled. Like, I'm not coming in there to just, like, upset the apple cart. But I'm just like, this is my biblical conviction. And I think if the Bible is really our authority, not not just merely and and un uh unanalytically un in an in a non berean way we're not re-examining these things to see and and holding our beliefs according to the text because we're not traditionalists as protestants right mm -hmm. we don't we don't believe the magisterium and the tradition we believe the bible so i'm like if yeah. that's really true then i want to believe the bible and i don't want to do it in isolation i would like to read the scriptures and study this stuff in community so I was trying to do all that, but I was also trying to be very upfront about it. So that's kind of the context of of some of what led up to these disagreements in this meeting and all that. So back to that night, this meeting. So we're all sitting around, and he tells me he's basically just trying to take up my bandwidth so that I don't infect other people with my, you know. It, it's very Jonathan Haidt disgust factor, you know, my my icky, dangerous ideas type stuff, right? Um, <clears throat> that's how it felt. And uh, and so then I just responded to that because I was very um, gobsmacked, up. I guess. Yeah. I, I was very, very hurt. I was very just like, wow, that feels gross. Uh, I, well, I feel <laughs> friends. Um, it feels like a betrayal that what you had thought and what he had previously communicated was the foundation of the relationship was actually not true and that it was something else. Yes. Um, and so I basically said as much because you, I mean, you also know me, like I'm first percentile politeness. I'm not afraid to say things. Um, and I, and I was still at that point, I was still relatively calm. I was just like, if, I said, basically, like, if I'd have had any idea this is how you felt, trust me, I wouldn't have been asking you to get together and forcing you to do something you didn't want to do. You know, mm -hmm. like, why would I do that? And then what happened is the head pastor said to me with, I mean, I don't, you know, and this is my own, this is my own personal take, like a fairly condescending smug look on his face, like, oh, I think you knew. So then he basically tells me, like, I think you knew this is how this other guy felt, and you were just, I don't know, like, I don't know what he implied with that, forcing him to do it, trying to push my ideas on him. I mean, I don't know. I don't really know what he meant. But um, but at that point, like, I got pissed. <laughs> and, well, that's, um, yeah, that, a similar thing happened, you know, when, when people imply that they have deeper insight into your knowledge and motivations than you do, it's... Yeah, right. Yeah. 
Yeah. So that felt very gross. And I, and I basically, and everything, everything got really heightened at that point. Um, you could just feel, you know, I'm an empath and an intuitive somewhat. And so you could just, so then I got mad and I was just, and I basically said like, and I, and I just said it explicitly. I said, well, excuse me. Like you just called my character into question there. This is no longer you're about accusing like me whatever. of lying. Yeah, you're yes. accusing me of lying. Yes, and and I said, and that's a much bigger deal. And I said, and you would have no way to know that, you know, essentially what you just mm -hmm. said. And so, and I said, that's, and I feel like that's really out of line. And and a lot of see, this is so. I'll just try to get through the story, and then I'll make a few comments on it. And see what you say. So then I got very fired up, and and then at that point. And I looked at both of the guys, the associate pastor and my, who, who I thought was my friend. And they're both sitting there, which to me in retrospect and having thought about this a lot, a lot, I think if they were honest with themselves, realizing the pastor was out of line, realizing this was inappropriate, realizing that he's uh, impugning my character and calling me a liar, and they said nothing. And they just sat there silently, reinforcing the status quo, letting the system do its work, letting the pastor abuse his authority, as I see it. And and thankfully, Jen was home at that time. She was downstairs with the kids doing something. And I said, I want, I actually want to go get my wife. Ooh, did I just... <laughs> and, and I want to, um, and I want to bring her up and I want to... And I want you to say what you just said again, so that she can be here as a witness. Because apparently nobody else here is cares about me more or less. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, and so I went and got Jen. She came up, and um, and uh, and it's fun. And then what? Ha and I feel bad because my wife does not want. My wife doesn't like confrontation. I was putting her in a hard spot, but I was also upset and I didn't really know what else to do. You need and, it felt like you need allies and witnesses. And yes, totally. A, a, a greater collective um, view on the situation because with the, the, the group tilted against you so strongly like that, like the collective decision of the group could way more easily tilt against you in an unfair way. Right. And so... Um, so she came up, uh, the pastor, the pastor, uh, kind of completely changed his tone, was very different, didn't repeat what he said before. And, um, and at that point, um, I don't know if I explicitly said this, but I, but I basically decided like, I'm done with this. Like, I'm not, I'm not participating in this anymore. This isn't a, like, this is a, what's the term? Like, this is a kangaroo court. This is yeah. not real. Nobody really cares about the truth here. Um, you guys had an idea of what all this was beforehand. Uh, you came to make that happen. Um, and so, I mean, so like all of that, all of that to me. And, um, and what's interesting is even like later, a few weeks later, I've never had resolution about that. Oh, the last thing I'll say is the the pastor as they were leaving, because I basically just stopped for the rest of the night and said, like, I'm, you know, I'm done. I'm not going to talk about anything else. Like, whatever. You guys can just do whatever you want. And, uh, and then as the pastor was leaving, he hugged me and whispered to me in my ear, like, I, and I think this is right. I mean, memory is hard. So, I mean, I may be getting some of the detail wrong, but I think this is true. Basically, like, I hope you can forgive me or something. But like whispered it to me privately and then left. I don't know. And the whole thing felt really gross. And then, but because of all of this systemic stuff, like even a few weeks later during worship, right? Singing during the things, I, I know, I know myself and how I am. And I basically like, I don't know. I used to do this all the time during these <laughs> charismatic -y worship things. And I'm an emotional person, but I had some sort of like, repentance thing and I was just like openly sobbing during worship about something and I and I felt bad for the pastors because I was just like and I went up to them afterwards and and I wasn't and I didn't say like you know everything was fine but I basically told them like I understand with all of this because it was also a church plant I understand with all of this that 
having someone like me in a church is difficult. I acknowledge all that. Like I'm not, I'm not an easy person to church. I'm not a, I am not kind of like a, I'm thinking about all this stuff. I'm always trying to see where I'm wrong. I'm always trying to see where the group is wrong. I'm, if, if I get around a lot of people, I was just talking to a local friend about this. If I get around a lot of people where we all start to have the same opinions and saying the same things, I immediately get uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I don't like it because I feel like we're in group think. I'm like, this feels wrong to me. We can't all be thinking and saying the same things. I start to feel like I'm in the Borg, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, and I don't like it. And I, and I said, as pastors who are trying to create, you're trying to create something in unity and get a, and get a church going. Like I'm not the person you put on a church plant team, <laughs> you know, uh, cause I'm not like the standard yes man. Like I'm very, I think I'm very loyal to what I'm supposed to be loyal to. Mm -hmm. Um, but, and but you're yet, enthusiastic about what's happening. Yes, but it, but it's difficult. And so I apologize to all that. And then my pastor said something like, that's all I was trying to get you to see, which also like, I don't believe, like, I don't think that's what he's trying to get me to see. Like you're trying to get me on board and kind of like what you said to just like shut up get with the program stop being a problem but like so realize so the problem's that, you yes yeah the problem that, that, that's what he us. wanted he wanted you to he wanted you to realize yeah. and understand that the problem isn't him the problem's you yes and so all of that to say like this is a good lead into what i would call the spirit of confessionalism because Theoretically, just as a thought experiment, in your situation or in my situation, I'm not, I don't want to sit here and try to make the doctrinal point of like who is right and who is wrong. Theoretically, as a thought experiment, maybe some of the issues that I'm bringing up are correct. And so then, if we really believe Sola Scriptura, all I'm ever trying to do is hold us accountable to the things that we say we believe. To, let's bury in this business. Yeah. Right. And I don't think mm -hmm. people actually do that. I mean, and that's, that's probably one of my big struggles with confessionalist churches. And this is where I like, this is why I love Peter Rollins is I don't think you guys actually believe the things you say you believe. I think you think you do. Mm -hmm. And I think what happens is there is very rarely a person like me or a person like you, because this is what I asked you of your situation. You see, this is what happened. I left that church without really making a fuss. I let them control all the systems and the dynamics and when and where we met and who was there. I didn't like, because Matthew 18, I didn't take it to the church. I just let the pastors deal with it the way that they wanted. Because let's just say as a thought experiment, let's just say the Bible teaches annihilationism. Well, that's, that's what I believed. That's what I was advocating. But then through your systems, you excluded me and pushed me out to whatever degree. I left voluntarily somewhat, although there were points of manipulation and, I don't know, shadiness and weirdness there, potentially. But then now what you've done is you've excluded the fringe. You've kicked out your potential for seeing air and actually repenting and actually being like Semper Reformanda reformed and continually reforming and holding yourself to this Berean standard because you've excluded that through the system and you don't even know you're doing it. And I'm the kind of person who, and I put, and I like, I said a little bit of what I felt, but I didn't push beyond in a way that was going to be divisive to the church because I don't want to do that. And you, mm -hmm. you did the same thing, but probably even, I mean, if I had to guess because of your temperament, you probably even said less than I did in your situation. Minimal, yes. Or you Minimal maybe... necessary force, yeah. Right. And so, like, like there, there so, to, a... so to me, this is a problem. This thing that we're talking about is a problem. Mm -hmm. Like, there was the the assistant pastor was somewhat assigned the job that um, the person who talked to you was assigned of, let's give Sam someone to talk to to cordon this off. Even though, mm -hmm. as the assistant pastor, he actually has no authority because he's not on the voting elder board. The pastor okay. is, and the seven elders are. Assistant pastor has soft authority and connection to those people and can report back, mm -hmm. and that could and influence them. But he doesn't even have a vote, literally. 
um, in the situation. And so we read the Gospel of John independently and then came back and talked about it with wives. Um, so two on mm. two, not just one on one. <clears throat> and there was a point in that conversation where I was like, um, buddy, your friend, person, I was about to say his name. So that that's why mm -hmm. buddy yeah, came out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, hey, buddy. I'm not, I'm not trying to convince you. Uh, yeah. Like I, because if I convinced you that I was right, I would ruin your life. <laughs> totally totally <laughs> but like okay so so like we say all, all that all, that's all, funny all i'm trying i'm not trying to convince you of my propositions i'm trying to convince you that i should be allowed to stay in the church and play piano yes so, I'm so not we say all to that convince you i'm right <laughs> yes we say all that and that's funny but what you just articulated the humor in that and why it's funny what's underneath that is the spirit of confessionalism that i'm talking about yeah, if I convinced you, life? yes, yes. And the reason, and, and I think the reason that a lot of confessionalist statement of faith people don't really see this and can't see this is because they don't have the temperament to, like the kind of temperament when I was describing the way that I am, trying to always see the thing that people aren't seeing and trying to figure out where I'm wrong and where other people are wrong. That's, that's a, that's a abnormal trait. Most people aren't that way. Most people mm -hmm. are like, if you think about it in terms of the Enneagram or just base society, and this is a good thing, by the way, most people are status quo people. They're like loyalists on the Enneagram. They're not, they're not trying to upset the apple cart. They're not trying to see what's wrong with things. They're trying they to assume just the like, group is smarter than they are. They, yes. which is most of the time probably true and yes. that a good yes. coherent you know sheep flock is made up of mostly go along get along do what the group is doing sheep it's order and chaos most things have to be no. order no that's good but it but if but jordan peterson but if you if you systemically preclude and exclude and kick out the little bit of chaos the fringe the weird the unknown, the scary, the doesn't you, fit in the box. Yeah. Then you institutionalize an inability to repent, or learn, or adapt, or correct. Yes. Yes. That's yeah. what I mean by confessionalism. That's yes. what I mean. So then, when people come back to me and they're just like, "What about the creeds? What about the early creeds? Do you like the creeds?" I don't have a problem with creeds. Creeds are fine. As long as you don't hold to them in a way that is an unbending thing. Like, this is what Verveke and I think Bishop Maximus have been talking about when in their emanation and emergence conversations. And it's what I talked about in those videos that I made recently. Is you can't, you can't conflate essence or religio or the thing that binds or unity with definitions, with the creeds, with credo. Mm -hmm. And creed used to, my priest told me this, like the... The creed used to be referred to as the symbol of faith. It, so mm -hmm. technically it is emanation and emergence. It's both these things. So you can't, so what confessionalism does is it, it kicks out emergence. Like there can be no evolution here. The, there can or, be and no that there's learning nothing, here. There's nothing deeper about what the creed or the confession is saying. It's all there on the surface. It's a mere it static ideal. Right. It's a it's a static graspable. This is all that it means. It means no more. Whereas you're saying something, a better version of that, a creed compared to a confession, let's just say as the dichotomy, could um, uh, contain truths that are true, but also point to something that's deeper than the mere semantic. Um, yes, it has sense. to be an icon rather yeah. than an image, a which portal is into something which, deeper. Yeah. Yes. So like, which, which isn't, so like none of this stuff is surprising to me after having gone through this last five year journey, because I'm like, of, of course, of course, this is what propositionalist rationalists would do. Of course they wouldn't understand that a creed is an icon. Of course they, mm -hmm. they have no context for understanding any of that. They don't know their, own, they don't know the place that they're standing within their own philosophical and theological evolution. Right. And they've precluded themselves from the ability to learn from those who can help them see that. Yes, because they're isolated. 
because mm-hmm. they're they're fundamentally isolated because that's what happens in Protestantism is you have some big division over an idea or a relational division or something like that and then you schism and this group goes over here and this group goes over here and they have hard walls around and, and if that's anybody part and again, of why the church that's part of why the churches are scared about discussing new ideas is because they're yeah, scared of course. schism. And yes. there is some amount of that that makes a little bit of sense and that it's some sort of built-in deep defensive mechanism. Um, but it but, also is because they need that defense mechanism because they're too brittle. Yes, they're they're not uh what what's the they're not anti-fragile, you know. They're not they're when very it comes, fragile on this subject, yeah. When it does when it comes to engaging intellectual ideas, which is why this whole community, this whole little corner, this whole estuary thing has evolved. Because this right. is the only place that we can have these conversations. Mm-hmm. And right? my my church was is also currently really struggling with um, eschatology questions uh, because the Evangelical Free Church of America, which is at, which is a big denomination, right? A lot mm-hmm. of mega churches are that. It's a spe- especially in the north and the south. A lot of Mega churches are Baptist or, or Methodist or something, but in the, in the north, uh, a lot of our uh, them are EV free, and the EV mm. free church for a long time, you know, on their official statement of faith, had the premillennial return of Jesus Christ as a explicit call out. So they were premillennialist, not a or postmillennialist, explicitly premillennialist, mm-hmm. and that comes to connections with. Um, uh, um, dispensationalism and a couple other of those, you know, late 18th, right. early 19th century or late 19th, early 20th century stuff. And there, you know, there's reasons for that. Um, mm-hmm. But the rise of young, restless and reformedness has meant that there are more Calvinists <laughs> that are interested in these sorts of churches or going to these seminaries. And um, the somewhat relative decline of um, dispensationalism has caused them problems. And so they've softened both a lot of seminaries like Tr- Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, which is near where I live, which is like the flagship seminary of the EV Free Church and a lot of other sort of related things, has also softened its stance to be, we believe in the return of Jesus Christ. And you can be flexible on premillennial, postmillennial, amillennial, mostly because yeah. then they can accept people from a somewhat Calvinistic background or a young, restless, and reformed background who tend to be amillennial. And, yeah. my, uh, and the church that I'm in has been trying to hold the line on the premillennial thing. Um, but they're, but it's experiencing pressure kind of from above and outside to be more amillennial accepting so that, well, you know, because it has such a strong relationship with the seminary yeah. and the seminary has downgraded its stance on that. And they normally get pastors from that seminary or related seminaries. Uh, so then, but this church has very temperamentally conservative, so it doesn't want to change its mind. And anyway, so th- they're. The, the threat of propositional, um, uh, uh, I don't know, disintegration, splintering or something like that. Because I could imagine if my church voted to downgrade premillennial from the statement of faith, that there would be some old timers who would be upset about that and seriously consider leaving. Um, right. But then it makes it more difficult to hire a pastor because right. then some pastor <laughs> so- coming out of seminary might be a millennial when previously they could trust their seminary to teach premillennialism. Right. So what ma- what all that makes me think of and I'd love your thoughts on this is that the the what what that makes me think. And and sorry if this is just blunt and uncharitable, but like what then really matters isn't so much whether or not we think these things are true. It's just very practical. It's very just like about numbers, and this actually comes down to a privilege thing. And this, I don't know, somebody was just talking to me about this recently, but like if you go to some country like China or whatever, like uh, certain places where where Christianity is maybe unpopular or does not have a degree of um, historic privilege or something, or it's not majority culture things, people don't people don't divide over this stuff like Christians right, of right. every stripe and culture and creed or confession or self identity, ideological be- bent just come together because they have to, because otherwise they wouldn't have a community. Right. Right. And, there is and, something. And, yeah. Of And so of a, I don't know. 
they have the luxury of disagreeing about these sorts of things here. They have the luxury of disagreeing. So again, this is where I like don't think I don't think any of this is really about everybody talks about this truth first and the, like we care about the truth. I actually don't think any of it's about the truth. I think it's about um I don't know. Uh, what would it be about? Uh, identity functioning, uh, seeming cohesion, but it's not. I don't know. Peter Rollins. What do you What do you think about this? This is what came to mind. Peter Rollins describes community as people that are centered around an idea and ideas, and he describes communion as people that are gathered together around a, a common lack. So, like, it's some. It's it's a it's a process thing. It's some kind of a thing where it's just like you could even think of it somewhat as a creed. I don't know what to what degree he'd be okay with that. Where it's like uh, it's something that we are, you know, it's the Augustine hedge around a mystery. It's something. It's this constantly evolving, emerging thing where we are. It's the spiral that we're constantly centered around, which is the center that you never the essence or the 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 core that you never quite reach because if you ever reached it it would be this like what does that even mean mm -hmm. it would be like this mm -hmm. static what happens when you attain this idea of a complete perfection then what you know this is i think why people have such a hard time and hate the idea of this perfect heaven where you're sitting on a cloud playing a harp all day they're like that's dumb and boring, Sounds boring. that's yeah that's because it's not real did you listen to the recent verveki and maximus stuff the three-part thing that came out yeah yeah i and just referenced it a little bit ago okay yeah so um that in the third lecture right they spent a lot of time talking about heaven basically yeah um because it was i think it was primarily about the flow state but Maximus yeah. was, and I forget the other bearded uh, Orthodox <laughs> dude's name. Um, yeah. <laughs> and they were talking about the idea of sort of a dynamic heaven um, mm -hmm. that, that there's like both perfection, but it's also kind of, um, I don't know, in movement and, and some, and yeah. something like that, as opposed it's to. A qual it's a qualitative relational perfection versus a mm -hmm. quantitative yeah, you know all the all the sands have filled the jar or whatever idea. Yeah. So okay, a thought that I'm having about this is like you and I. So like in your old Berean mindset, we can agree that there should be a standard that's like almost deeper than whatever the statement of faith happens to be at any given time. That there's a process that can be gone under to determine the truth. And that is sort of going back to the scriptures, trying to understand what it means, probably in its original context or something like that, discerning propositional truth from that process and that sort of thing. So that if there is an error on the statement of faith, there's an agreed upon methodology of how to address that. And so that there's actually something that's being agreed upon that's deeper than the statement of faith which is the method by which statements of faith are generated or supported. And um, that I feel, and this is probably where we're a little bit different, that I'm still pretty darn Protestant about this. Push into the difference. Um, but that I, I feel like, to me, what I was saying is, is that I agree with the process, maybe, by which statements of faith should be generated. But I don't think that you're doing it properly and right yes but i don't but at the same time i think that my disagreement with my current church was deeper than that too it wasn't just i think i agree with confessions you just had the wrong confession let's go through the confession editing process fairly and rightly and um see what happens from that i was another clear difference that came up in virtually every conversation that i had with this church whether it was the pastor assistant pastor an elder or whoever was what the relationship between propositions and salvation because really Protestant mm. churches are super focused about <laughs> soteriology and right. their constant fear is not that also not just that messing with propositions will 
harm the unity of the church, but that it'll cause people to be damned. Um, and right. And one of the which, main... which, if you ask them explicitly in like a Sunday school way, this is why I talk about the Sunday school answer: Are you saved by believing certain propositions? They'd say, "Of course not." Mm-hmm. But how come everyone who's raised in those churches feels that way? Right. <laughs> and and well, I mean, there were explicit points where I feel like I wasn't even getting the Sunday school answer. I was getting the "Yes, you need to believe the right thing, or else you're not saved." Like the first yeah. meeting with the pastor where I, again, similar to you, was pretty blindsided, um, was very much his whole goal of the meeting was to make me realize that my salvation was in jeopardy because of my beliefs and that he had at least warned me. And then, yeah. and then, and then it was in, he had done his responsibility of uh, saying that and what I did with that was on me, but he, his responsibility as the pastor was to make sure I knew darn well and clearly that my soul was in currently a state of jeopardy because of my propositionalness. Uh, and, and so, but I was pushing back on him on that. And I said, okay, pastor, what would happen if you gave a Trinitarian pop quiz to the congregation right now? And right. he admitted, and he like he knew <laughs> that everyone it wouldn't go would well. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe not everyone, but like an embarrassingly high percentage would fail any sort of Trinitarian propositional pop quiz. To I'm which like, Jacob, oh. to which Jacob is just going like, yeah, because it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> right, it doesn't land intuitively in the mind. I'll just put it that way. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and and. Oftentimes, people have to reverse engineer something that makes sense to them, which is often a heresy, quote unquote. Yes, yes. Uh, Very true. And so what I was saying is, are all those people damned? And if so, why aren't you spending every Sunday between now until everyone gets this right? Because if this is the thing that jeopardizes souls, then what else should you be doing? besides getting your church to be able to pass the Trinitarian propositional pop quiz. And he's like, well, okay, well, you know, he was doing the thing where like, actually they don't need to, they don't need to know it at that level because that's an unreasonable thing to ask. Because like Mm -hmm. when you go on a mission trip with these churches, which I have ironically, um, they're not going around teaching the Trinity when they're trying to evangelize new people. Right. The, that, that, that ne- it never comes up. Literally, it never right. comes up. Right. You have to believe Jesus Christ is Lord. You have to believe He died for your sins. You know, yeah. um, some substitutionary atonement stuff, and right. and a experience with Jesus, a confession, a repentance. That, right. right. Or what that, do you t- what do you teach kids? Right. Jesus right. loves me. You, this I know. For the Bible tells yeah. me so. Whatever. That that that's what they actually think yeah. saves people. Right. Yeah. You know, the, the Jesus prayer plus you know some changes of heart and stuff like that, and the Trinity literally just isn't on that list at all and so i'm i'm pushing this point and he's knowing it yeah and and so what he's saying to me well the problem is is that you know that you believe something different the people in the pews might not yeah, be able to explain we? the do trinity you? but you you know that you don't believe the trinity and that's why you're you're in jeopardy in a way that those people aren't and so, so what's then, so what's hard in all all this sam sorry is like there's truth in all this. Like there's truth in some of the stuff they're saying. I just don't think it's completely true. And I don't think they quite realize the stuff they're saying because none of us are saved by our propositional belief and our abstractions in and of itself. But is it true that those things that like wrong ideas are dangerous and can lead you in bad places? Yes. 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 Yes, That is true. And you so, and I like, both agree to, with that. yes. And so, like, to what degree should those things be prohibited, and how should they be prohibited is the problem. Because of what we were talking about earlier with confessionalism and what we've experienced is they're prohibited to the degree of like borderline absolute uh, exclusion. Like, mm-hmm. you, you don't even let them into the church, into the consciousness, into anything. If anybody's talking about them too much, you get rid of them. Um, and like, and that's a dangerous thing because to me, really what this is all about, I think the best way to think about these things is, is everything is truly about this emanation and emergence thing. 
Everything is. I, I would push it all the way down to <clears throat> ontology and the way that being happens, but I think also the way that belief and thinking happens is an emanating and an emergent thing within ourselves and within groups. And so, like, what the pastors are saying that is true is that the emanation thing, the idea thing, the static idea of the proposition in and of itself is important. But then they're completely excluding the emergence or any sort of evolution and change happening within that, which is mm-hmm. necessary. You can't, you can't completely exclude that. And then there are the people on the other side that, like, th- this is the caricature of me all the time, is that I don't care about the ideas or the emanations or the propositions at all, and I think they don't matter at all. No, that's not what I'm saying, and that's never what I've been saying. You know? Yeah. Um, and, I, and I think both of those things matter. And th- so then, I guess, I don't know, maybe I messed up your flow and you were going somewhere else. Um, but... I, I guess what I guess what I was saying is that I I was I do I'm not just a confessions are good we just need the right confession or something okay. like that because I was saying that no I don't think that your propositions save you in the way that you do Mr. Pastor yes and so and and an analogy that I gave is like all right. And again, this is all very soteriologically focused. And in my mind, this needs to be handled in more than just, there's more angles to this than just soteriology, but it's becoming focused on soteriology because that's the way these churches understand the question. Yeah. Well, getting like, saved is of, yeah, of most yeah. importance. Right. And like one can understand that perspective, but it's more complicated than that. And sometimes you need to bring in other angles on the question too. But part of one one analogy that I would give to them is like, okay, so how do you get, how do you ride an airplane from one airport to another? Um, at, at some level, you have to have some propositional correctness about what to do. You have to show up to the right airport. You have to go through security. You have to bring your boarding pass. You have to be on time. You have to know what gate you're going to. You have to not break any of the rules. Etc. So you have to have some knowledge to get on the airplane, but you don't have to know how the airplane works to uh, get from one airport to the other airport. Um, the airplane works, <laughs> and you have trust in the airplane to work to get you from one destination to the other. And so, what I'm like, what I was saying to these pastors is like, to me, what it sounds like you're saying is the only way that the airplane will get you from airport A to airport B is if you understand how jet engines work, understand how to operate the plane, could yeah. explain with physics how the mechanics of the wings cause lift and flight, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that in, unless you understand that perfectly, the airplane's not going to get you to the next airport. I'm like, that's not how it works at all. You, you're right. trusting something. And so do any of us really understand how salvation actually works? in its fullness no but we do need to know some things in order for it to happen and that was sort of the analogy that i was getting to them but then at some level maybe some people need to have some understanding of the airplane uh because someone needs to be fixing the airplane and maintaining the airplane and that mechanic better know its job and stuff like that and so that so the but it's also just an analogy but what yes. I was saying is, is like the, the propositions aren't what saves you. No. And, and, and I think this is why I love uh, philosophy and going into that is because if you think the propositions save you, well, there's an infinite regress there with like your airplane. Because what? Because how do you mm-hmm. how do you understand that? You can understand how the engines work. You can understand lift. You can understand all that. But then keep going down. Go all the way down into atoms. How do atoms work? How do yeah. you, you know, this is like what Indy Wilson talks about in his book, Notes from the Tilt World, that I love. How does, um, you know, how do quarks and leptons and up quarks work? You know, what are right. they? Yeah. You, you, if you keep pushing that line all the way out, you'll realize the only what George way Donald they... said, no man understands anything. <laughs> right. Or that omniscience would be required for salvation. Yeah, even even if there is such a thing as like a quantitative set of knowledge that you can know. And as my buddy Cal says, is like the set of all sets. Well, then what is outside of that set? 
you know, this is why I always pushed on the monism, dualism, Trinitarianism thing, because like if there's a set of which nothing is outside of, you can't even determine that. It's a monad. There's no mm -hmm. context to determine that. You couldn't even know that. And like what I just said, like most people have not thought about philosophically enough, like that will just sound like utter gibber gibberish to them. Mm -hmm. But like, I think it's true if you push the logic and the reason back far enough. And so then I think ultimately, tell me if this is true, Sam. I think this is where we may be a little different is that I don't think propositions don't save you. There's no authority that you can go to. That's a text that can save you. Cause it's not, it's not your confession. It's not the text in and of itself. It's the thing that's behind the text. Which yeah. is well, even Jesus basically straight up says that, right? You search in Moses uh, because yes. you think that in the scriptures you have life, but you know it's they that point to me. That was a rough yes. uh, tr quotation. I didn't get that exactly right, but Jesus is making the exact point that mere scripturalism isn't the thing. It's the scriptures are good and true, but they point to me, and that's the point. Yes, and so trusting me is what matters. This is why, like, when we were talking with Trip the other day about why, and you were explaining me to Trip because Trip and I talk past each other sometimes, because you were just like, when people don't believe Luke and just, and kind of give a little bit of faith to what he's saying and then agape whatever he's saying into existence, which I think you do a good job with, by the way, I take it as like a breach of trust. I'm just like, would you just trust me? This is why I get mad at Paul all the time. Because everything we've just been talking about is like relational ontology and personalist knowing. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, Paul, I was talking about this stuff like four years ago, but you weren't listening to me. And slowly over time, like Peugeot and Verveke have started to talk about it with Maximus with a lot more technical precision and using different, not wooey, made up idiosyncratic words that Luke uses. But I'm like, it's the same stuff, Paul. <laughs> wooey idiosyncratic words that luke uses yeah because well, yeah. i make up all my own stuff because i'm not because i'm a weird auto who hasn't read course. all this yes yeah yeah, yeah. I know. so i mean that's kind of i don't know that would be my i don't know how that sits with you of like trusting a trusting a person versus a text and those things are interrelated because you well, can't trust the text of the bible without trusting the people who wrote the Bible. This is what this is the Orthodox sola scriptura or Catholic sola scriptura argument all the time. Is like people will say like, well, we trust the Bible, and Catholics and Orthodox will be like, where do you think you got the Bible? Yeah. Right. Or and it also brings up like say the Bart Ehrman problem. You know. Okay. So what about a textual scholar who knows the Bible better than any Protestant yes. in their yeah. churches, but totally. doesn't like quote unquote believe in it? You know, what's that yes. distinction? You know, yeah, and again, okay, I'm not saying that Bart Ehrman has perfect understanding, but let's just imagine a perfect Bart Ehrman who uh, was, you know, <laughs> oh, let me imagine it. <laughs> who who uh, was a just a, a pure textual biblical scholar, but um, there's still something. I, I think every every Christian knows that there's the something else that is more than just knowing about it. Um, yeah, and, and it's I mean, what exactly is that? And this was another thing that came up in the conversation with my pastor. I'm like saying, what I think salvation really is, is that transformed life experience that happens, that born again moment, the personal, <laughs> I'm like, and I, I will also say that I'm intentionally using his language in yeah, yeah, yeah. a way to, not that I don't agree with what I'm saying, but, yes. um, but I'm using the very evangelically buzzwords um, yeah. to hit him where he's at. Right. Yes. And, and I'm like, you know, I have the personal relationship with Jesus. You know, I've been a, I've thought of myself as a Christian my whole life. I can remember, you know, praying the Jesus prayer at, you know, uh, whatever age it was. And, and, you know, all of these things. And like, I feel like I know Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Who are you to say that I, I don't? And he's like, well, you know, if you don't think of him as God, then you have a false Jesus is basically, I'm like, how do you know that? You know, you, you're claiming, right. to be like, he's like, you worship a false Christ. I'm like, okay, that's tempting me to go down the worship veneration distinction. I'm not going to go there right now. I'm just going to roll with this. But like, basically, my propositions are causing me to point at the wrong Jesus. And even though all of the other things 
like I line up with with what an evangelical thinks is supposed to happen in order for salvation to happen. Like right. And and so that that gets to the subjectiveness of what it means. Yes. And like well, that's exactly what really I was. Know? Yeah. That's exactly what I was thinking because that's that's what comes down to this was what what you said remind me of a couple of things. So it reminds me of uh oh what's his name Darwin's black box he was just on Rogan what's Michael Behe or um yeah. Stephen no Meyer. not Michael Stephen Meyer yeah. Michael Behe yeah Darwin Black's black is Behe right yeah, I think so but see, anyhow Stephen Meyer was on there and they had a lot of good conversations and it kept they were talking about this thing that we were talking about because they kept trying to talk about the facts the objective facts the details of all that. And then when it came down to like, why are you a Christian with Stephen Meyer? It was always the, it was always the personal. It was always the subjective. It was always this I know thing. Mm -hmm. But but also I think what's false about the subjective objective divide though is is this is this this is this thing that has evolved in the Western consciousness that I that I also don't think is legitimate because I don't because there isn't such a thing as the merely subjective or the merely objective. Those two things are always related. Those that's the emanation and emergence yeah, thing again. I, I, I agree with that. Kierkegaard is really good on that subject for the record. He really helped sort of break down that subjective objective because objective is really just claiming to be a really big version of subjective when you get down to it. Yeah. Yeah. It's and the, it's... Uh, mo the monarchical vision, but it's still a vision and it's still subjective. It's just from like yes. a higher place. Yeah. This is what I call the hard problem of all perception, even of ideas. Like we, in science, you know, they, it's the hard problem of consciousness they talk about with science, but you have that with anything, any perception, any intuition, any idea, any insight, there's a seer. You can't get away from that. You know, like you can't divorce me from anything that I know in any way that I know it. And that's always there. And that's not, and it's not just subjective because those because it's always both things at the same time, always. Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't, I, I mean, I suppose at the end of the day, this is like where I get into, um, it's why I talk about um, personalism so much is because it's a all knowledge, all, all knowledge, all knowledge is, is. Um, <laughs> knowledge is kind of a nice word. I, it's like, it somehow strikes the ear differently than knowledge. It's so weird. I don't, I don't, I have such a, I have such a loose relationship with language that it is, it's funny. I was talking about this the other day when I was doing Myers-Briggs stuff with a local buddy here. And I brought up the illustration that I said once to my wife that I said, I'm going to go out and vacuum the driveway because like I just, and it was, it's cause it was snowing and I wanted you to go shovel it. But I just said, go vacuum the driveway. Cause like the, somehow in my mind, like the specifics of the word and the definition don't matter to me. It's the, yeah. it's the action. Like it's, right. it's what needs to be done. So like, vacuuming, shoveling it, who cares? My wife and I get in arguments like that a lot where I'll, I'll have invented a word or use a word wrongly. <laughs> and I'm like, and she'll get mad at me for, I'm like, but did you understand what I was saying? And she's like, yes. Well, yes. I'm like, so then did I use it? Did I use language improperly or not? If you understood what I was saying, because no, Which is... I know exactly what I, I know. I know it. What is exactly what you were saying when you said, no. right. Which is how, like, this is why I love Barfield so much and, and language so much. And even like, uh, um, philology or whatever it, and history and English words, all these things is because like even vowels, like you don't need vowels. This is why I think I used to get frustrated with people who, because my whole life I've done this, believe it or not, I'm sure it's easily believable, where I've said things where people are just like, what are you saying? That makes no sense. And I get, and I've always gotten frustrated because I've always felt like, well, you should know what I mean. <laughs> like you should know what I mean. And I think why I've always been frustrated with that is like you should because I've always known that all meeting is meaning is relationally bound. And, and so like if you know me, if you love me appropriately, you know you know what I mean. But also at the same time, like to some degree I have to love other people and use I have to use some semblance of the proper language or else they're not going to know me, know what I'm talking about at all. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't all of a sudden start speaking like, and this is, I don't know, we could go a lot of ways with this and we should probably wrap it up, but like even morphic fields is like, if all of a sudden I inter start interacting with someone who's Chinese, I don't know Chinese. Like no matter how much I try to love you and understand your meaning, like 
there, there's certain things we're going to understand because there's certain relationships that we have in morphic fields, I would argue, that we have overlap with. Like we're both human. You know, we can both see. We have faces. Physical gestures maybe overlap a little bit, although there's going to be cultural differences. But like the language piece is gone. And so like, I don't know. How true is it that you need to use the exa- – what is the value? Maybe that's a good question. What is the value of exact, precise, technical language in – true communication and i suppose that's always been my critique of what i would call technological babble and myopia is that if you hyper focus on technical language and precision you'll lose the forest for the trees and you'll miss the unity and you won't actually communicate Mm -hmm. so i don't know all right (laughs) no sorry i yes uh resonate i understand what you're saying i'm feeling okay Good. Right, la- last question. Um, how? So, what? What? What does make a church unified, and how does that um, work? And how should it deal with dangerous propositions? Because you and I are sort of going in different directions on this. One thing that I, because I'm going to a very much more charismatic leaning church now, charismatic churches very heavily emphasize the perspectival, the experiential, and that subjective experience. Yeah, yep. That's, they're designed to try and get you to have and experience that with the way their services work, with very passionate emotional music, um, the content of the sermons, and just their whole general attitude and strategy is trying to get you to, to have that experience and that shared experience and search for that experience is something like the underlying unity and propositions become much less important in that. And I've like, I've noticed that coming from, you know, having been in pretty propositional confessional confessional Protestant land for a while coming back, even though I kind of grew up in a charismatic church, it was, I don't know. It was an unusual, the, the charismatic church I'm going to now is much more charismatic than even the church I grew up in. And it was I still probably tell, pretty heady, the church yes. you grew up in. I'm the guessing, church yeah. I grew up in was a little bit, ha- had a foot in both worlds, I guess. Yep. Yep. It was a very propositional charismatic, charismatic church. Yeah, that's yep. like my churches too. And, and, and this one is much more like, actually, this is about the feels. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and it's a very different kind of unity. I wonder if it like, it, it's an alternative offer on on how to do it. And yes, you can imagine how they could can care about propositions and stuff like that. But you could also imagine them having a much looser and softer touch on these sorts of questions. Whereas I feel like in Orthodox land, it's also a very different approach. Um, it's much more, I don't know, it's easy for me to maybe mischaracterize it, but it's like trust in the institution is really more important than... It's- it's probably more trust in the tradition and the liturgy and the, the the ritual. Yeah, yeah. You know that has come before you. Um, but a and, lot and more I, hierarchy too. Like the 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 charismatic church doesn't have much hierarchy. Right. Uh, well, sometimes it kind of does, but there does become a hierarchy of uh, expertise in the experience. But um, but for the for the Orthodox Church, it, it's very explicitly hierarchical. And that's right. at some level why they don't need to care too much about what all the sheep have going on in their heads, as long as they are sort right. of following the shepherd, so to speak. No, I think that's true. And I think, so So from my perspective, I'll just speak to orthodoxy as a way of trying to answer your question of what is the balance. Um, uh, and, and, you know, it, it probably goes without saying, being that I'm at the Orthodox Church, I think that's the way they're doing it is proper. Otherwise, I'd be somewhere else, um, probably. Uh, so I think because of the way that orthodoxy handles things is it is it is simultaneously kind of... it's Orthodoxy is this funny thing because it's simultaneously very heady. Like, mm. interestingly, they don't... They don't have the same kind of scholastic, Thomistic rigor, you know, that kind of... I don't know if you listen to that Blondell episode, the Jordan Daniel Woods new podcast and Charles or whatever, but like, um, that's excellent by the way, but, um, they don't have that exact kind of spirit, but yet 
I mean, read some orthodox, uh, you know, hitters of, of like uh, Alexander Schmemann or Florensky or, you know, the early church fathers. Like, I mean, there there's difficult things in there. Or Bishop uh, and, Maximus, you know, he's like yeah. getting way down into the weeds <laughs> on very specific Neoplatonic details of yes. why Aquinas is wrong and essence energy distinctions from yes. Palamas is correct. And he cares very passionately about that distinction and thinks it's, you know, the fundamental difference why we're doing something right, that they're doing something wrong almost. But Yes. And so that's that's all there, but it's not there in like a rationalist top down for structure because I think the Orthodox just intrinsically know that that's all there in the tradition, but like there's no formal way of, of even promulgating it. It's, it's, it's a very personal approach. So like a lot of people will go to seminary and they'll get trained to be a priest or a deacon or something like that. And they, or, and I imagine it's even this way in monasteries where all that's there and they're teaching a lot of that, but to whatever degree you go into it, is is kind of up to you like if that's something that you need like like for somebody like me and not all priests are this way even like i have different priests in my parish some which are much more philosophical and heady and what i would call to be like very intellectual and some that aren't at all uh, that don't seem to be to me like we never get into those conversations and so um like if you want to pursue that avenue in orthodoxy you kind of can and it's there and tradition and history there's writings you can find all yeah. that stuff but you don't need it and they don't expect everyone to do that because not everybody's going to be helped by that or even need it or be able to understand it it's of no value to them so for them they're just like and so for everyone it's basically like do the liturgy do the rituals do the sacraments like that's that actually has everything in it it's kind of interesting the more you do the liturgies the more like little things will pop out or st words from the liturgy or or practices in the liturgy and all of a sudden like it'll hit me in another way where i'm just like oh wow like i never connected that or saw that unity but it's all in there but they don't have some core there's no there's not really formulas within orthodoxy besides just like besides the sacraments which i would which to them i think is what they think is is like handed down from Jesus to the disciples and like passed on through that tradition. Like that's what Jesus taught you to do. They're just, that's what the sacraments mm -hmm. are. And um, let me pose a question. I, I feel like part of the way that orthodoxy handles this is that there's no way that Luke is going to change the proposition of the church. No, there's no way that the priest is going to even Bishop Maximus has like virtually no ability to influence the the beliefs and 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 stuff of the church. So would and that so, be the emergence part of it, like the emergence part of it? It's is... all, I, part of me is almost like they I, I think one reason why um, the Protestant confessional churches are difficult is because they know that they're technically supposed to be propositionally open, but they're terrified of that possibility. Yes. And yes. so they react and cut it off. And yes. so they say that, yes, we are, we technically, the Berean path is open, um, but it only causes problems. So we're going to do everything we can to prevent ever needing to go down that path. Yeah. And part of that danger and legitimate fear is it happens so fast within Protestantism. Yeah. Because it's the and speedboat it, thing. And it often causes schisms. And, and right. It, right. And and whereas it's not like orthodoxy hasn't had propositional updates. Like Gregory Palamas yeah. yes, was very yeah, yeah. controversial in his time. Yes, yes. And there was a lot of fighting around some of his ideas and his monastic practices and stuff. There was the iconoclasm controversy in the 8th and 9th century, which yep. was really big and difficult. Yep. And then the, the mother of them all, the Arian controversy in the 4th century. <laughs> And then all of the how many how did the two natures of Christ fit together controversies in the fifth century? You yeah, know, those were all things, and like those things did divide the church. Um, yes, and those divisions still last. Like the Egyptians and the Armenians and the other ones are still out of communion from those splits. Yes, and, and the, so the reconciliation it, is very slow. But I think within or it's just <clears throat> so I think within orthodoxy the way that they probably see it and approach it is like it's not that there can't be updates you know mm -hmm. um but it's not but like it's just, a greg they're open to gregory paul mosses in the future too like 
there could be those and there could be a Maximus the Confessor in the future that yes. comes and does manifest, you know, truth in a way that requires update and integration. But it's probably, but the thing is, is I think orthodoxy realizes because of history is it's probably not going to happen in your lifetime. So like, even if you are a Maximus, like you're probably going to get your tongue cut out and mm -hmm. die a heretic and then be vindicated in your, you know, 100 or 200 years later. Yeah. Right. And I, and I think Orthodox just kind of know that. And so like, if you, if you care about the truth so much, and this is a very Christian thing that you're willing to die in a very Jordan Peterson way for your honest articulation of what you believe to do in, in a stance against, uh, you know, this body, this, this intimidating body of thing, if you believe it so much and you're, w and you're willing to stay to not like splinter off and divide, but stay and die for what you believe in a very kind of probably Erasmus versus Luther kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. Um, then, then like you, you may, you may be vindicated, uh, sometime, but you'll probably die. Yeah. And if you believe it enough for that, then that probably lends credibility to what you're saying. And I think the belief is that like all that stuff will just play out because they're not so worried about getting the the propositions exactly right. I mean, well, because they, they are, think the sacraments it's... are really what saves the people. Right. And the and liturgy it... is what sanctifies the people. Then they're less concerned about the propositions in the pews. Right. And even the creed is pretty, I mean, we could, I would love to do this with you. I pitched this to you and maybe we will do it or we'll talk about it more at some point, but just like even going through the, the Nicene Chalcedonian creed, because it's, because it, people will often say, because for me, like you would say that like the difference between the Nicene creed and the apostles creed is different. Like you, like yeah. the apostles creed is pretty easy for a Christian to affirm, but like for you, I, I, you I think don't, that I, yeah, I think the Apostles' Creed does a much better job of being that iconic thing because yeah. it's narrative and not yeah. um, abstract. That yeah. narrative always has an inherent ability to contain more truth than the mere level of the words that make up the narrative. And has, like, yes. like parables can be very deep, even though they're still transmitted by words. There's, a, there's more depth than just the words because it gets a parable and a story across. I think the Apostles' Creed is much better at like limiting itself to being an expression of a story and events, which yeah. lends itself to that iconic deepness. Whereas I do think that the Nicene um, Constantinopolitan Creed tried to be like, we are actually containing the right answer in our words and that it's not pointing to the deep Yeah. Ends. Well, and, and to whatever degree, I, Jordan Daniel Wood said this once when he was talking about being a neo-Chalcedonian, you know, talking about his whole mystery of Christ and what all that means and entails. But he said the problem isn't so much that Chalcedon was wrong in what it said. The problem is thinking that we understand what Chalcedon was saying fully in a quantitative mm -hmm. fullness in a way that excludes, again, the fringe. Mm -hmm. You know, we're circling all the way back to the beginning. Is like, is your understanding of Chalcedon fully encapsulable. Yeah. And and, and, and Chalcedon is interesting in that it didn't actually put forward a positive answer. It was like, you can't say this. There, there's an error in this direction, mm. and there's an error in this direction. Mm. And then the probably the right answer is somewhere in between those two errors, but we're not going to fully <laughs> explain what it was. My suspicion is that there is no correct answer inside that box, but, <laughs> <laughs> and that it's a it, there it, the cat isn't even in the Schrodinger box there. But um, but you're right that it was actually somewhat apathetic in its approach of the final answer. Okay, well let's uh, let's wrap it up and then maybe right. maybe we can talk about if there is an answer in the in the box or not and yeah. go into the detail of that because you'd be able to talk about the detail more about it and then I. And I can always riff. All right. But anyway, I'll let you go. But thanks for this, Luke. Uh, I appreciate it. I don't know. I hope it was better. I hope, I don't know, people understand. I don't even want to read the comments. Like if people, I'm so, I get so depressed when people 
the the misunderstandings of what I mean by confessionalism depress me, and so I don't even want to read the comments. You can just tell me. I'll t- I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll send the good ones your way. Thank you. Nice. All right. Okay. okay. Thanks, Sam. Thanks.